excited about it. Um, we'll be talking about Rethink DB 2.1 and some of the high availability features that we've introduced. This has been a huge deal for us. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of background on 2.1, uh, why it's important um, for you guys and Rethink DB users. Um, you know how we got started, what sort of what development looked like, and so on. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel. He's gonna show you a demo um, of high availability in Rethink DB 2.1. And then we're going to do a Q&A session, and both Daniel and I will be answering questions. So you guys pay attention, and then you can ask anything you want about 2.1 or Rethink DB in general. OK, so let me tell you a little bit about Rethink DB 2.1. Uh, many of you probably heard about it from the blog or Hacker News or Twitter. Um, but I thought you'd enjoy hearing a little bit about it from us. So Rethink DB 2.1 includes a lot of different things, but the major, major feature that we've put in is high availability. And what high availability means to users is this. You know, you have a cluster of database machines, let's say three or five three or five machines. And in any real environment, any real infrastructure, what's going to happen is you're going to encounter hardware failures. So either a machine goes down, you know, that's a simple case, or you run into problems on the network. Um, you know, if that happens, um, you can have split brain scenarios, you could have switches failing, routers failing, you could have cascading. Um, net split scenarios across different data centers, stuff like that. So all kinds of failures can happen. And what we've done with RethinkDB 2.1 is we've put in an enormous amount of work um, to make the database clusters handle all these failures automatically, or at least as many of these failures as, as even theoretically possible in computer science. So we started um, the development and planning for this release over a year ago. And this was a major, major undertaking. We've learned a tremendous amount um, from people using RethinkDB you know, in the wild before this feature was in. And we just sat down and we had to figure out, okay, how do we build something that really addresses all, all user demands and is very easy to use? So we've looked at, at what people are doing and what kind of kinds of failures happen, at theoretical failures that could happen. And we also looked at other products in the NoSQL space um, and we looked at, okay, how are they doing it? And we discovered a couple of things. So the first thing we discovered is if you take any product in NoSQL um, or any product similar to RethinkDB um, and, and play with it and, and start actually testing it in, in real environments, then what happens is they don't really do very well when you have complex split brain scenarios or complex network failures. Um, because they've kind of done, you know, people have done a pretty good job, but, but some of the more edge case um, edge case failures can, un, can result in pretty catas catastrophic scenarios. And the second thing we learned is that um, these products are very often really, really hard to scale up. Um, it's hard to create clusters. For example, if you're using MongoDB, to really create a MongoDB cluster um, that runs at scale and runs well, you need to be an expert. You need to know a lot. There's a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of setup. It, it's really, really hard to do. So we designed um, RethinkDB 2.1 to address all these issues. Um, it addresses all of the kind of edge case issues of split brain scenarios and hardware failures. And it's designed to be really, really easy to use. And Daniel will, will show you how it works. You don't have to be an expert. Anybody could set up a database cluster. It's very, very simple. Um, it's very simple to operate in real environments. And if something goes wrong, it's really nice. Like you don't have to wake up to deal with the database cluster. We'll handle pretty much all, all of the problems that are going on. And then you can come in next morning um, and you know deal, deal with your hardware failures. So the development process, um, we looked at a lot of different things. The first thing we did is we implemented um, Raft, which is a distributed consensus protocol that came out of Stanford University. So Raft is at the core of RethinkDB 2.1. It's kind of a heartbeat um, of the whole system. Um, it's the beating heart in, in, the, in the high availability aspects and clustering of everything to be. So after we implemented Raft, the next big challenge was, OK, how do we um, refactor our clustering layer to take advantage um, of, the, of the Raft protocol? And how do we offer you guys an API um, and a set of tools to make using everything to be in high availability environments really, really easy? And we wanted to make high availability the default. So you know, if you set up a cluster, you don't have to do anything. It will just be HA out of the box. So the process of, of refactoring the code base um, to work with Raft took a pretty long time. It took probably three or four months. Um, so we, we did that. And it was just a lot of engineering effort because the code base is big and complex. 
And then we looked very carefully at, at the UI aspect of it. And I don't mean just visual UI, although that too. I also mean the APIs that we offer to manage the cluster. And we worked really hard to basically keep exactly the same APIs um, that we think we had before. So if you ever set up everything to be cluster, all of the commands still work. The web UI still works in exactly the same way. The system tables still work in the same way. And we added a couple of other things that you can use to um, um, to work with the cluster in emergencies if you have to do some, some special thing. But in general, you shouldn't have to worry about that. And basically, the exact same API that you've used before works um, you know, in exactly the same way, except everything now is HA. So we're very excited about 2.1. It was a monumental engineering effort, user experience effort. It was just an enormous amount of hard work. Uh, we're all very proud of it. Actually, the whole thing to be team went rafting um, yesterday to celebrate the raft release. So, you know, a little fun there. But that, that really happened, and it was a lot of fun. Um, so we're excited to show you the demo, answer all your questions. You know, if you guys have questions, please post them on IRC, on Twitter, or in this webcast and go to meeting. And we've got a couple of people, um, Christina, Michael, and Daniel, who are monitoring the questions. And they'll be passing them on to us, and we'll answer all your questions at the end of the podcast. OK, so I'm going to turn it over to Daniel. And Daniel will show you some of the things I was talking about. Yeah, all right. Uh, let's get started. Um, let me share my screen here so you can see what I'm doing. Um, is that working? OK, all right. Uh, just got the feedback that the screen sharing is working. All right. Um, so what I have here, oh, sorry. All right. um, so I've already started three RethinkDB servers. And for this demo, I just, I'm just running all of them locally. So I have these three terminal tabs. And each of them is running one RethinkDB instance. And um, as we can see here in the web UI, uh, these three servers um, are joined into one single cluster. Um, so let me show you what you need to do uh, to um, make automatic failover work, which is our feature that allows you to recover from server failures, network failures, and a couple of other problems. Um, so in order to show you, I've created one table here, the test table. Um, and I'm going to just click on it to show you uh, how this is currently configured. Um, so right now, this is the default configuration which you would get after creating a table. Uh, we have one primary replica and one replica overall. And we don't have any sharding enabled. Um, so Slava said earlier that automatic failover um, works out of the box. And you don't have to do anything. That is almost correct. You have to do one thing, though, which is really important if you want to make use of that feature. And that is you have to uh, configure your table to replicate. Um, and I'm going to do that right now for this table. So I'm going to click Reconfigure and set this to three replicas. Um, and this is really important. For automatic failover to work, you need three replicas. If you just have two replicas, uh, that's not enough for automatic failover. You will still have a copy of your data. So in case the server fails, you can recover but you will uh, have to do that manually. You will have to run a command to tell RethinkDB um, which server should continue serving the data. Um, and actually, to give you a bit of background for why we have this um, requirement, um, so the Raft consensus protocol um, works based on the concept of a quorum, which basically means that um, you need a majority of replicas, in our case, um, in order to um, continue serving queries. Um, so if you only have two servers and one of them fails, uh, you will only have one server left. So that's only half of the servers, which is not, strictly speaking, a majority, and we cannot continue. However, with three replicas, um, they're now in the situation where if one server fails, uh, we still have two left. So that's clearly the majority of these three servers, and uh, RethinkDB can recover. Daniel, someone's just real quick. Mm -hmm. Someone is asking a question. Um, Kim is actually asking a question of why are we seeing writes happening right now? All right, yeah. Um, I was going to get that in just a second. So these writes um, are caused by the script I've started. And you can see it doing its work here at the bottom of my screen, actually, where it's printing these dots. Um, so I just wrote a small script, uh, just running little inserts, inserting small documents into the database um, so we can see that queries get through and um, there's activity happening. 
Um, so that's all that is. Um, all right, so let me actually show you how the automatic failover uh, occurs if we um, start taking the server down. Um, so the first thing to note is that right now we have the primary replica running on server two, um, and we have the two secondaries on server one and server zero. So I'm now going to take out server two, um, and it's running here in the terminal. So let me just kill that process. All right. So let's use the connection here. Let me just reconnect that. All right. So what we can see now is that um, server two is disconnected in the status. However, um, server zero uh, has been reconfigured and it's now acting as the primary replica. So what this means is that it's not the server you've configured um, on the table to be the primary replica, but it's one that was temporarily uh, put in to take over by the automatic failover process. Um, and if you look at the bottom of the script, we can see that the inserts are still happening. Um, and also we can, of course, see that here if we scroll up uh, to the throughput graph. Um, and this is really interesting because previously, uh, if something like this would have happened, you would have to take um, manual actions and actually tell we think the which server should now take over. But this is now all happening automatically, and it just takes a couple of seconds um, until we think we realizes that a server has gone missing and uh, switches over to a different one. And it's a really quick process. Um, as I said, mostly a couple of seconds downtime that you will see usually, and then everything can go on as normal. Um, all right, um, let me maybe show you just one more thing. So there's also the question, what happens if you lose more than one server? Um, maybe one of the data centers, uh, I don't know, um, gets into an earthquake and uh, a lot of your servers um, get lost. So let's see what happens then. And I'm going to kill this other server as well. All right. And we can actually see as we start this. All right, it can't even connect right now, in fact. Um, so now we are in a situation that I mentioned earlier. We have lost the majority of servers. So out of our three servers, we only have two left. Uh, one left, sorry, we have lost two. Um, and so the system cannot recover automatically. Um, and just so you know what you have to do in a case like that, um, it's usually pretty rare. I mean, usually you will lose one server at a time. But of course, it can happen in special cases. So um, I'm going to go over to the Data Explorer. And we've added a new feature to recover from situations like this. So I'm going to um, access the table here. The table is called test. And um, we've added a new optional argument to the configure command, uh, reconfigure command, which um, they're calling emergency repair. Um, it's like this, OK. Um, and you give it one out of two, mo two modes. If you want to see which modes are available, let me just run this, and it will actually tell us. Um, so there are two modes, unsafe rollback and unsafe rollback or erase. Most of the cases, um, you can use the unsafe rollback mode. Um, and in fact, rethink to be uh, is going to tell you um, if you need to use another mode. So um, let me just try this. And uh, we will see if it's able to recover. And I run this, and we can see that it has updated the configuration. And um, now I should actually be able to run the queries again. And boom, yeah, that's working again. So this was a, it's a really quick process to recover. Uh, you don't have to mark any service dead. You just have to tell your tables, um, that, OK, I've noted that these servers have gone down, and I'm OK with maybe losing records from the past few seconds if some writes have been going on that haven't been replicated yet. And um, you just run this command, and it uh, restores availability, which is really neat and uh, really easy to use. Um, so I mentioned that in this case, you can sometimes lose records. I should also mention that in the usual case, um, where you still have a majority and automatic failover happens, we um, absolutely make sure that you do not lose any records, any writes that have been acknowledged. Um, and we took, actually, we put a lot of effort into guaranteeing this. Um, and there are some. Uh, yeah, some uh, very nice um, uh, principles behind uh, this logic that make sure that that's always the case. 
Um, all right, yeah, that's uh, the brief overview of how you can use automatic failover and how you can recover from other types of uh, server failures. Um, and uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, um, I think we can actually, start answering them now, or maybe you. Yeah, so I actually wanted one. to cover one more thing. So first, I, I want to do two things before you guys ask questions. Ask questions. Um, so the first, the first part is someone asked. Someone said that some of the attendees um, of this webcast are new um, to rethink DB, and they asked, um, you know, to just tell you a little bit about the basics. So I can do that right now, and then I want to ask Daniel one more thing about high availability, or a couple more things, and then we'll open the floor for questions. Okay, so just to give you a little bit on the basics of RethinkDB, um, you can learn a lot on RethinkDB.com. There are really good tutorials. There is really good information on why you might want to use it. Um, you know, how to get started is very, very easy, um, and I encourage you to play with it. But I just want to tell you a little bit about why RethinkDB exists and, and why we built it, and how it makes people's um, development lives easier. So we started Rethink because we noticed that the world is moving towards real-time applications. So for example, if you guys have moved, used Google Docs before, um, the way that works is if you have two users looking at a document and one user modifies it, the other user sees the change right away. Right? So this is what we call a real-time application. And we noticed that this shows up all over the place. So if you've ever used Slack, uh, which is a really popular messaging app, if you've ever used or actually any messaging app like Facebook Messages or something like that. If you use Quora that uses the question answer side that uses collaborative editing, if you ever done any real time analytics, if you ever built multiplayer games, um, this kind of collaborative real time use cases, they show up in almost every single um, environment, almost every single application. And the user experience of these things is just so good. It's sort of like Ajax when it came along you know, going back to the world before Ajax is unthinkable. And it's the same thing for real time. So what we noticed is that there's an enormous amount of innovation on the front end to help you build real time applications. So there's, you know, WebSockets and Socket.io. There's a lot of libraries like AngularJS and React. There is a lot of really cool, um, cool things that are happening. But on the back end, uh, the, the infrastructure, the tools haven't really, you know, gotten good enough. So people have to do a lot of work to build these applications on the back end side. And what we've done with RethinkDB is we fundamentally changed the database access model. So RethinkDB is the first and I think the only database right now that pushes data um, to you, to, to the application developer in real time. And the way that works is instead of just running a query and then running it in the loop every, you know, few milliseconds to find new data, um, the way Rethink works is you can say, I am interested in this piece of data. So you subscribe to the query that you want. And then anytime something happens in the database, we push out notifications saying, hey, the results of, of, of what you wanted has changed. So for example, if you say, give me, you know, top 10 selling products in my online store, and then someone buys a product that pushes something into the top 10, um, the database will automatically recompute this and push this notification to the developer. So what that does is, and we deal, by the way, with all of the scalability and routing and all of that stuff. And if you look at some of the tutorials on RethinkDB.com, it's just amazing how much simpler building real-time applications gets with Rethink. Um, so if you use any of the new front-end technologies, uh, plugging in RethinkDB makes building these applications dramatically, dramatically easier. And you can do it you know, with your favorite programming language. You could do it with Node.js, Python, Ruby, tons of other languages. Uh, you can use it with your favorite stack. We're completely agnostic to the web framework. Um, so it just makes the developer experience of building these kinds of new applications dramatically better. You can do it faster. You don't have to put in as much work. And as a result, you know, your code is simpler and, and you can deliver just much more compelling user experiences with much simpler infrastructure. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the basics of everything to be. Um, we don't have that much time, so I don't, you know, we don't want to start going into a tutorial, but if you go to everythingdb.com, there's videos, there's tons of resources for you. Um, okay, so before we ask, before we go to questions, I just wanted to ask Daniel, maybe you could show uh, one more thing. So we did a little bit, so the API changed a little bit where we introduced the feature um, to allow people to promote and demote replicas. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't have to do it live because people typically wouldn't encounter it, but maybe you could mm -hmm. talk a little bit about how that works and show show where that exists and why you might want to use it. Yes. Um, let me just enable the screen sharing again so I can actually show you this. Um, is it on? Yep. yep. 
Right. Right. That's you. There we are. <laughs> so um, this is actually an interesting new option we have added. Um, so previously, we had exactly one type of replica um, that you could configure for a table. And now we've added a second type of replica, um, and we call it the non-voting replica. Um, and uh, this has some pretty interesting consequences. So I told you earlier about this uh, requirement that you have a majority of servers in order to, um, or a majority of replicas, more specifically for a table, in order to uh, have automatic failover. Um, so in certain configurations, um, that might be a very limiting factor. For example, if you have half of your servers in data center A and you have a second data center somewhere else, uh, data center B, um, and um, if half of the servers are in each of them, you uh, will get the situation that if one of them fails, um, for example, maybe there's some networking issue, um, you will not be able to get a majority in the remaining data center. Um, in addition to that, um, we also uh, require majority of replicas to acknowledge a write operation. This is something that um, we already did before, and that's for uh, data safety reasons. Um, and so if you lose that second data center, um, you would not be able to perform any write queries anymore, uh, simply because you cannot reach a majority of the replicas. Um, and so we have added a new, these new non-voting replicas, um, and they give you an option to add kind of a, an asynchronous, asynchronously replicating um, backup of your data. Um, so the, the, a non-voting replica receives all the updates, all the writes, uh, are always replicated to it the same way they are replicated to regular replicas. Um, however, the difference is that non-voting replicas um, do not, uh, are not required to respond to a write query before it can be acknowledged. And um, that has the, uh, the benefits for availability that I just mentioned. And it also has benefits for performance because um, uh, if uh, you have a high network latency to reach that second data center, um, you don't have to wait for it if you uh, set, configure those replicas to be non-voting. Um, and maybe I can also show you how you set that up just really briefly. Um, so if you look at the configuration for the table, um, we can actually see down here that we have a new field non-voting replicas right here in addition to the replicas. Um, so you can see that every server is in the replicas list. Um, but some of them can additionally be added to the non-voting replicas list. And the reason I have these two servers in here right now is actually because I just used the emergency repair operation. Um, so internally, the way emergency repair is implemented, usually you do not have to deal with this detail. Um, but how it works is that it actually demotes um, replicas, current replicas to non-voting replicas. Um, so that's why you see some servers here. But if you want to configure this yourself for performance reasons or um, to fine tune your um, availability, uh, you can simply add uh, some of the replicas to this list, and that's all uh, that's necessary to make that work. Daniel, there was a question. Um, could you talk a little bit about how many servers, how many everything could be servers do you need to have high availability? And, and specifically, what happens if you have more than one failure? Like, how many servers mm -hmm. do you need to handle two failures, three failures, and so on? Mm -hmm. um, sure. So. Um, the, the most basic setup of automatic failover is a cluster of three servers. Um, and in, in the end, it all comes down to this majority rule that I mentioned. Um, so if you have three servers uh, and you lose one server, you can still, you, you still have the majority because you have two out of the three original servers left. So you always have to think in terms of how many servers you had originally and how many of them are still there. Um, if you want to, uh, for example, be able to um, recover from two server failures, so if two of your servers fail, and you still want to be able to run your queries uh, without any manual intervention, um, then uh, following this rule, this rule, you basically need five servers in your cluster, because in that case, if you lose two, you will still have three. Three is a majority out of the five. Um, and you can uh, go on like that uh, and basically compute that number pretty quickly um, by uh, you basically take the number of failures that you want to be able to sustain, take a times two and add another server. Okay, cool. All right, so we'd like to open this up um, for questions. Uh, so you guys, please, if you have any questions, please type them in the chat and we've got our wonderful producers here who are working very hard. Um, I can see sending these questions to us. So you can do this on Twitter, 
um, IRC or here in GoTo meeting, and we'd love to answer all of them. So I'm just going to get started, and me and Daniel will, will cover um, a couple of these. Um, okay, so the first question was, um, does RethinkDB, does using RethinkDB make sense if it's not, um, if your use case doesn't involve, involve real-time applications, so if you're just writing a regular app? So the answer to that is yes. Um, RethinkDB is strongest because of our push architecture uh, when you need real-time applications, but actually it's a really good general purpose distributed database. So if you've ever used MongoDB, at the beginning RethinkDB is pretty similar, but it's got a couple of things that make it really stand out and make it a better choice in many cases. So the, the one thing, the first thing is that the query language is RethinkDB is really, really, really easy to use, even for advanced things, and it's very flexible. In particular, you could do, you know, you store documents just like you do in other NoSQL products, but in RethinkDB you can also do joins between documents. You could do MapReduce that works really well. You could do a lot of advanced computations, and the query language makes writing these things really easy, um, and it works very efficiently. The second thing about the query language is that it supports um, things that you'd normally expect from a relational database. So, for example, it supports joins, um, and it supports subqueries, and it works, again, it's really easy to use, and the database cluster will automatically distribute them, do the computation, and give you the data. So, the query language is much more powerful, easy to use, um, it's really good. And, on, and the second thing that makes everything to be special is on the back end, um, when you're starting to scale out your database, we think, I mean, so I'm definitely biased, you know, because I care a lot about this project, but I really think rethink B is probably better than almost any other product on the market as far as how easy it is um, to actually scale out and the guarantees that we give you. So it's extremely easy to scale out a cluster. Then I'll just show you how, just showed you how to do it with three machines. And if you look at some of our tutorials, you know, setting up a cluster of 10 RethinkDB nodes and sharding and replicating is absolutely trivial. You could do it in the web UI, the interface is really simple, and you could literally like, so usually people say you could do it in, you know, five minutes, and it's typically an exaggeration. But in this case, you really can do it in a couple of minutes, and you don't have to worry about very much. So it's really, really nice, and you get all of the guarantees. So, like, the headaches go, you know, completely go away. And I was actually talking to um, a customer yesterday. I was talking to one of our operations people, and it, it was really exciting. So we're going to do a case study about it, and we're going to post a video of him talking about it really soon. But he told me, like, hey, you know, I used to use some other products before, and it was just really hard. It was a huge headache. And we think it'd be the dream come true for me, like as far as operations goes, it's just absolutely wonderful. So even if your use case isn't real time, it's a really, really nice product. Um, it's a lot of fun to use. It's very easy to get started and very easy to scale. Um, and anything you generally use a NoSQL database for, you think it'd be typically um, a really good choice. So I'd encourage you to take a look. Okay, so I'm gonna take some more questions. Um, sorry, there's actually kind of a lot, so I have to sift through this. So HA1331 asked, this might not be important, but I thought you don't cover all the edge cases. I'm talking about non-transitive connectivity failure in particular. So I'm going to let Daniel talk a little bit about the edge cases, but I, I want to tell you a little bit about how we designed it. So the idea is that it doesn't, the way this was designed, like it doesn't matter what handle, what happens in your hardware, and it doesn't matter what happens on the network, it was designed in such a way that you should never get into catastrophic scenarios. So if you get something really strange in the network where, for example, non-transitive non connectivity, you have two machines, A and B, A can talk to B, but B can't talk to A. Like, that's really weird, because if you cut the network cable, for example, they both can't talk to each other. But in non-transitive connectivity, it's one of those rare things where one machine can see the other, but they can't, the other one can't see the first one. So things like that that are really strange. Uh, with Rethink, you may not have like full availability if something, if like that one in a million case happens, but we're not gonna corrupt your cluster, we're not gonna corrupt your data, we're not gonna corrupt your configuration. So edge cases like this that are really strange, they're still covered. You may not get the best possible um, outcome. So for example, theoretically, it might be possible to give you availability, but we may not do it in a case like this. But it was definitely designed with all these edge cases in mind. And um, at the very least, like nothing's gonna be corrupted and everything's gonna work fine. And if something goes wrong, it's a bug and we'll fix it. So the, the architecture takes account of this. 
Um, Daniel, do you wanna, is there anything else you want to say uh, about edge cases that are really strange? And... Yeah, I, I think we basically covered all of it. So, um, yeah, like Slava said, in the case of non-transitive connect connectivity in particular, uh, we still guarantee uh, that all data is safe. We never do something uh, that might damage the data. Uh, we keep all the consistency guarantees. Um, there are some cases, as Lava mentioned, where theoretically, in the case of non-transitive connectivity, we could uh, restore availability automatically, and um, we are not doing it. Um, but those are like uh, usually rare edge cases, uh, depending on your network setup, of course. Okay. Um, another question from Kim. Will having replicas also improve query speed in terms of load balancing, since, since queries could be split among replicas? So Daniel, could you talk a little bit about how to improve performance mm -hmm. with, with you know, replication? Yes, yeah, totally. So, um, so replication is primarily a data safety feature in VPNPD. Um, however, we have a uh, sort of um, companion feature to that, which is sharding. Um, and you can configure it just as easily as replication, uh, just through the web UI. And sharding uh, causes queries to get parallelized across all the nodes automatically, and you don't have to do anything, anything special. You just write the usual queries as if you would write them if um, you only had a single server. Um, but once you enable sharding in your cluster, then all those queries will automatically be uh, split up into um, subtasks and uh, be computed across all those servers in parallel. And that's basically the feature you will want to use. So replication can, under some circumstances, be used to um, improve throughput as well. Uh, but primarily, you will want to use sharding in that case. And of course, you can combine both of them. You can use both replication for data safety and sharding uh, for performance. OK. Um, another question from HA1331. Majority reads, do you have plans to optimize them in the short term and have them as the default mode? Do you want to take that? Or yeah, I, I can answer that. Um, so in RethinkDB 2.1, we are also adding a new read mode. So we used to have two modes, um, the default, and we used to have a, a special outdated reads mode, um, which you could use to improve performance um, if you uh, were okay with data that was like outdated by a few seconds. Um, and that was useful in a few uh, um, special scenarios. And that still exists. Um, and that still exists. And we have added a third mode now, which is this uh, majority read mode. Um, and majority read, uh, um, well, it basically uh, raises the level of guarantees that we give for the read results in the case of server failures. Um, with the default read mode, um, you can uh, occasionally uh, read a document um, that was modified by a write before the write got acknowledged. Uh, this is usually not a problem, and if no server fails, um, nothing, uh, you, you won't get any inconsistencies from that. However, um, in certain corner cases and for very specific applications, they need the absolutely highest level of consistency, um, you will want to use the new majority read mode. So that, that just to explain what this is. Um, so right now, majority reads are um, quite a bit slower than regular reads. Um, and we have plans to optimize them. Uh, I can't tell you when exactly that's going to happen, but um, we have uh, some plans to uh, make it more efficient. Um, whether we are going to switch them to uh, to be the default, um, I'm not sure. We'll have to see how fast we can make them. In general, um, majority reads sorry, majority reads will always be somewhat slower than uh, the default reads. Um, simply because we have to coordinate across multiple servers in the cluster in order to uh, ensure these um, high guarantees for consistency. So I don't think they will become the default, but um, it's certainly something we might consider if uh, they uh, end up being really fast. Okay. Um, question from AB. How is this different compared to MongoDB architecture? Is it master-slave or multiple master? Mm -hmm. Yes, we think DB is master slave, so it's um, pretty similar on that level. Um, the high availability uh, is obtained um, through uh, automatic master re-election. So we have primaries and secondaries, as we usually call them, rather than master and slave. And um, if the master fails, uh, we simply fail over uh, to one of the other uh, replicas of the table and make that the new master. Um, however, of course, you can if you have a net split situation, um, which is uh, usually the case where this is important, um, then only one side of the net split will be able to uh, process writes. 
And this is actually by design, and it's really important because if you don't have this restriction, uh, you can get inconsistent data on both sides of um, the net split. And um, yeah, so, so this is a design decision we made, and we think that it makes it a lot easier um, if you write an application to reason about the state of your data, because you don't have these weird um, scenarios where data is different depending on which server you ask. Um, uh, but yeah, if you need the absolutely highest level of availability uh, and with respect to write queries and really large clusters, um, uh, some other products might have a better trade off there, but they also make it a lot more complicated to handle the cases. Um, another question from Alex. How often is data replicated across shards? Is it instant or is it configurable? Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, data is constantly streamed uh, from the primary to all the secondaries. Um, so you, there's nothing to configure there because it just happens um, basically as quickly as possible. Um, in addition to that, uh, if you run a write query, we actually guarantee that at the time the write query returns, uh, the data has already been replicated to a majority of the replicas. Um, so your data is always safe. You basically don't have to worry about um, replication lag or anything like that. OK. We've got a question, another question from HA1331. And I actually, um, I really love this question because it's very near and dear to my heart. So the question is this. Um, doing updates of nested data is almost like alchemy at the moment. And I know there is an issue open currently about that. Do you have any idea when this issue will be addressed? OK, so uh, the reason I said this question is near and dear to my heart, because I do completely agree that doing data, doing, um, data updates in, in nested data structures is almost like alchemy. It's not actually that hard, uh, but it is very, very frustrating. Um, it's kind of annoying. And we, there's an issue on GitHub. Daniel, do you remember the, the issue number? I don't remember, I don't remember the, the issue number right now. I head. can um, look it up, though, and I will post it uh, into the GoToMeeting chat. Yeah, so there, there's an issue on GitHub that has a proposal about um, making this dramatically easier. So if you have deeply nested documents, right now getting the data out is really easy and pleasant. Um, but, but updating the data inside nested documents or arrays or documents within arrays, like that, that's actually pretty hard and frustrating. So we have an issue open to, to, to fix that. And HA1331 um, asks, do we have, you know, when, when is that going get to get done? So unfortunately, doing this is pretty complicated because it requires a pretty major restructuring of the query language. It's not, there aren't really any open technical questions there. It's just a matter of doing the work. And we've had quite a bit of other really important things that, that many users have been asking for. So in the past, um, in the past maybe six months, the usage of RethinkDB really, really grew. And we have a lot of users that want, you know, very different things and all of these things are important. So we're working very hard to prioritize um, all of that stuff. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer on exactly when this is going to be done. But this is a non-trivial um, engineering project. And it's kind of, we haven't done that quite yet. And we prioritize other stuff because with respect to um, updates of nested data structures, like it's doable. It's hard, but you can do it. So there is, it's not a showstopper for a lot of people. It's a matter of convenience. And we've been working on showstoppers for a lot of different customers. But this is something like I personally find very annoying when I use Rethink to be. I'm sure a lot of other people do too. So I don't have an ETA, um, and I'm sorry about that, but I promise that we'll try very hard and schedule it as soon as we possibly can. Okay. Let's see if there are any other questions. So comment from having none. I don't have a question, but just wanted to say thanks for this informative meetup. Been using Rethink for quite a while, and I'm looking forward into the future. That's really going to be a lot of fun. Um, you're welcome. It's actually an enormous amount of fun for us to do these webcasts because it's kind of a low pressure environment. A lot of people come in. We get to show off some of the stuff we've done, answer questions, talk about it. I don't know. I've always been really enjoying them. It's, it's probably one of the most fun things um, that I do. I don't know, Daniel, if you how enjoyable this is for you, but oh, yeah, I think it's not a fun. <laughs> um, OK, there's a question from AB. Um, is there a concept of an arbiter? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, so we have looked into the possibility of adding special arbiter nodes. Um, we do not currently support arbiters. Um, and the reason is simply that um, even if you have an arbiter to break uh, the tie between two partitions of the network, um, you, you still cannot guarantee that the data is up to date. So in this case, uh, we, uh, we made data consistency a priority. Um, 
and um, the arbiter does not help here because it doesn't hold a copy of the data, so it cannot resolve um, two different versions of um, the data itself. Um, what you can do instead is um, you can use the non-voting replica feature that we've talked about earlier, and in a lot of cases uh, that gives you a similar level of um, functionality. Um, it's not always the same, uh, and we might add an arbiter feature uh, later, but um, right now that's basically an alternative, and uh, we think that gives you the best uh, possible level of data safety. Okay, cool. Alex suggested we get a beer after this because we've done a phenomenal job. Um, I agree. <laughs> We're going to definitely good. set that up. <laughs> By the way, if anyone's in the Bay Area, our office is in Mountain View. If you guys want to come and hang out, email Christina at rethinkdb.com. Um, and Christina's there in the background laughing. She's our community manager here, and she's she's wonderful and very, very helpful, and she'll help you set this up. We'd love to meet you. Uh, we do regular meetups, so you can check it out at meetup.com. Just search for everything to be. Right now it's in the Bay Area where we show up, and we try to kind of travel here and there around the world. There's also lots of meetups around the world that users do, so if you want to meet the team or meet other everything to be users, uh, please look this up or email us, and, and we'll help you out. Um, okay, let's see if, are there more questions that I missed? Nope, our wonderful producers here say we've covered everything, um, and they're saying hello and waving. Um, all right, guys, thank you very much for joining. This was a lot of fun. Um, thank you a lot, everybody. It was great. Yeah, check out Rethink to Be. It's at rethinktobe.com. Ask us questions at Rethink to Be on Twitter. You can check us out at GitHub. Um, sorry, one second. Someone's telling me something <laughs> that I've been told is important. Um, let me just check this out. Okay. Um, yeah, this this is um, there's something that's going on that I can handle. Okay, so <laughs> check us out again. RethinkDB.com at Twitter and GitHub. Um, so guys, we're very excited about RethinkDB where it's going. We think the push architecture is going to change the way people develop applications. Um, you know, not just rethink to be, uh, but there's a lot going on in the field in general. And we're very proud of, of the of the clustering stuff that we've done. We're really excited about spreading the word and, and telling people about rethink. So, you know, if you could tweet um, about this webcast if you liked it or tweet about the product if you liked it, we'd appreciate it. Um, check us out on GitHub if you could start the repository. That would be awesome um, because that really helps kind of propel everything to be and, and, and have it thrive and succeed and introduce other people to it. And we also really appreciate when you comment on GitHub, specifically when you do feature suggestions, bug reports, or as our development team designs features, when you go in and you say, hey, you know, here's what I'm doing, I like it this way or I like it in a different way, that really, really helps um, make the product great and we couldn't really do that without you. So again, thanks for joining, I uh, really appreciate your time. And we're looking forward to shipping some more awesome software and really, really great features. So we're going to have another webcast pretty soon for the 2.2. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you.